thanks to all of you for, for coming to follow our invitation to come uh, to Berlin. Uh, special thanks to all the one of you, all the ones who contributed in the one or the other way uh, to the preparation of, uh, of this annual General Assembly through uh, a lot of uh, telephone conferences and so on. And uh, last but not least, thank you, uh, Samantha, for taking, um, taking this over this job of uh, moderating uh, this, um, uh, this assembly. Um, the world has recognized the need for improved food security and uh, improved resilience. But has everyone recognized that rural development is essential in achieving that improved food security and resilience? I'm not so sure. Whilst food security is definitely back on the international political agenda, and whilst resilience is something new coming in right now, as we learned yesterday, um, debate seems to continue, seems continue to be dominated by rather siloed um, approaches. Every one of us believes that we need more than isolated initiatives. And every one of us has an idea of what that something more should be. But are we thinking along the same lines? Perhaps we are getting there. I believe that there are three important points on which our ideas of what is needed in the field of rural development converge. First, efforts to enhance food security and resilience must reach out well beyond the narrow confines of individual sectors. The best sectoral strategy in the world will achieve little if nothing changes in the surrounding environment. So rural development is first and foremost about approaching the issue from a variety of angles. But that multifaceted approach will not in itself be enough unless all the individual elements are put together within their broader context. It was this realization that led to the adoption some time ago of the term integrated a rural development. That term had become somewhat ideologically tainted. Perhaps in adopting, adopting the concept of integrated rural development in the past, we were overambitious in our belief that everything in the world could be planned for and that we could tackle all the many complexities involved. Perhaps we were doomed to fail, but that should not mean that we now give up any attempt at planning and integrating altogether. And by, uh, by that I also mean spatial planning. Let us try for more complexity again. In our development cooperation, we once again need to complement our standard sectoral approaches with a spatial approach, and not only in rural development, but in urban development too. And if you really want to do a good job, colleagues, then perhaps we can also at some point get rid of the unhelpful dividing line drawn between rural and urban both in our minds and in our strategies. This would help to increase resilience too, I'm sure. Third point, I have made the clear case for more complexity management, but in fact, I would like to go one step further. The term rural development is gaining increasing currency, and that is to be welcomed. But often the concept remains rather vague, and rural development is seen as something of a magic bullet. What strikes me is that hardly anybody is asking specifically what rural development actually means in terms of the role played by the state. Some core functions and responsibilities of the state remain that cannot be delegated to the private sector. It is my feeling that we need to take a clearer and more definite stance on this issue. Where does a state's duty lie? What institutions and policy are really essential? What public services and agencies must exist if rural development is to truly succeed? And if a state is either unwilling or unable to fill that duty because it is fragile, either failed or failing, 
then the question that must be asked is what civil society can do to compensate as far as possible for the ineffectiveness of the state and how donors can usefully, uh, usefully support them in that. Over the last three years, there has been a major shift in the backdrop against which the debate on a revival of rural development is taking place. First of all, we were confronted with the global food price crisis, which involved not only a spike in prices per se, but far worse, a dramatic increase in price volatility as a result of economic instability. Since famine struck in the Horn of Africa, these problems have been viewed from a different and broader angle. The Horn of Africa was hit by a perfect storm of all imaginable problems. The drought drastically exposed the problems, the vulnerability and the lack of resilience of individuals and communities. It highlighted the unresolved political, social and ethnic conflicts the misuse and overuse of natural resources, the lack of governance, infrastructure, and trading networks, and a great deal more. In short, it highlighted the fact that rural development had long been neglected. The most important lesson I believe we should learn from the famine of the Horn of Africa is this. Rural development should not only strengthen resilience to economic risks, like increased price volatility, it should take a more comprehensive approach, strengthening resilience to all kinds of political, economic, social and ecological risks and instabilities. That was one of the most important messages coming out of yesterday's discussion. Last week, the World Economic Forum published its Global Risk Report for 2012. It makes interesting readings and fits in very well with our topics. It identifies five global risk categories, economic risks, environmental risks, geopolitical risks, societal risks, and technological risks. Mapping of these individual risks throws up a whole number of issues that are all of very great importance to us in rural development. Heading the list of the greatest global risks, both in terms of likelihood of occurrence and impact, are food shortage crisis, extreme volatility in energy and agricultural prices, water supply crisis, land use mismanagement, and failure to adapt to climate change. All on the same high level as uh, fiscal instabilities and all the other issues that ride on the top of the news headings uh, in, in, in these days. All the topics we are concerned with in rural development are extremely important to global crisis management. Any efforts to manage crisis inevitably also have to address issues of rural development. But equally, if we truly want to tackle poverty and hunger, we cannot pretend that crisis, conflicts and risks do not exist. We cannot limit our cooperation to countries that are politically stable and face few other risks. Quite the opposite holds true. We must focus in particular on unstable countries and ensure that we also have the right strategies for such high-risk countries. So rural development must that then mean, first, taking actions despite risks and stability, and second, taking action to overcome risk and stability. I believe that it is these two essential, uh, essentials of action that should be the focus of our work within the Global Donor Platform for the future. If we succeed in addressing these two political agendas together, coming up with workable strategies for them both, and also communicating our theoretical findings and, political and practical experience, then we will have done a good job. This throws up a great many questions which we all discussed yesterday. How can we link relief and development? What is the best way of working together with weak partners? What can we do when no real partners are available? How do strategies need to be designed to take account of periodic drought or flooding? What contribution can agricultural research make when it comes to increasing resilience? 
Um, do we have a precise idea of what climate smart agriculture is? How can we manage flood, uh, food price instability? What is our view of the importance of pastoralism and livestock farming? What uh, part can we play in boosting the regional integration that partner countries so urgently need? How can rural development help to reduce post-harvest losses? Inclusive business models. Is it just a fashionable catchword? Or do such models have real potential for de developing rural areas? How can agricultural production help to strengthen the resilience of rural population? And how can we increase aid effectiveness and development effectiveness to increase it? Dear colleagues, we could have wonderful discussions of all these questions at a series of specialist events. And to 20 questions, we would probably get at least 40 answers. But here, within our platform, our shared interest is a very specific one. Firstly, we are interested in the workability of all theoretical ideas. And secondly, we are asking what can we do as a group? How can we ensure that our cooperation delivers the most value added possible? And how can we as a group make ourselves as visible as possible? That also throws up the question, what are the potential areas of work for the platform in the next year? And how can platform members improve their networking and knowledge sharing in order to support this? I do not want to preempt our discussions on specific issues later today, but I would like to suggest that when considering what work the platform will do in the future, we always bear in mind the following principle. The platform is not an isolated planet. It is part of a global architecture and a member of an emerging global partnership for agriculture and food security. We should find our niche within this large network and identify our unique selling point. The most important thing is to ensure that the topics we address within the platform are 100% compatible with the debates and activities being undertaken by the other members of this global partnership. That is how to make our work effective and visible. I'm thinking above all about three of the other players operating within this global architecture whose activities we should look at in greater detail. There is a G8, or more precisely, the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative Group. Then there is the G20. And there is the Committee on the World Food Security, the CFS. In closing, I would like to touch on two issues that could be extremely interesting for our platform because they fit in very well with the ideas being pursued by other networks. Please take it as an example and just as food for thought. Firstly, with reference to the G20, a report from the Development Working Group for the Cannes Summit states the following under the heading Building Resilience and Fostering Growth. I quote, to achieve more inclusive growth and in the context of increasing risks. And then they sum it up. Macroeconomic instabilities, price and currency volatility, environmental risk, climate change, resource scarcity, natural disasters, growing inequalities, etc. There is a need to develop mechanisms to mitigate risks, prevent future shocks, offer better protection to the most vulnerable, and ensure that growth paths chosen are environmentally sustainable and financially viable. This quote, uh, colleagues, rather perfectly summarizes our yesterday's findings. I would like us to consider here today what contribution work um, on rural development can make to those aims. What mechanisms can we offer? The second issue I'm thinking of is the great interest shown within the AFC group and in the CFS in a global mapping exercise of donor activities and the institutional environment and country profiles in which donors operate. One essential element in increasing aid effectiveness and development effectiveness is to ensure that there is a better knowledge across the world of who is investing what resources in what parts of the world and what specific sectors. 
I believe that such a global mapping exercise would provide the platform with an excellent opportunity to make an effective and visible contribution to international processes within the CFS and the FC. I could prove particularly, it could prove particularly interesting to record not only what donors and partners are working on together today, but what they plan to do in the future. Yesterday, there was a call for stress, for stress tests. I could imagine that stress indicators could support and complement the work of AFSI around results management, results reporting, and accountability. This could, by the way, fuel the future aid effectiveness debate now beyond Busan. And, by the way, I could imagine that such a focus around results could open a window of opportunity to enter into new kinds of partnerships. For example, a partnership with the Gates Foundation, who is really keen on work, in particular on the results management. Colleagues, I would say to you that we must make a realistic assessment of our capacities. We should not set out overambitious plans that we are then unable to realize. Less is more. But let us be bold and imaginative in our plans. We must seize the opportunities that we have as an informal network. Our assets are flexibility, rapidness to of response, networking and knowledge sharing, and the opportunity we offer for frank and open dialogue. Thank you.